Okay. I'll mute to reduce the background noise. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so data ethics, it's actually at the end of these notes, although I don't think we've been filling these in very well. But anyway. Yeah, um, I, I didn't do mine. I just, because I did mine <laughs> totally in uh, notebooks and I didn't want to reformat them. So yeah, no worries. Okay, so um, we'll define ethics a little bit. Um, and then talk about some examples and major themes in machine learning and data ethics, and then discuss mitigation strategies. And this is mostly from the book chapter. I read the book chapter first, and then I turned the video on, and it was very much overlapping. And like you said, the video was two hours, so I, did, I just didn't pay attention. <laughs> Okay, so ethics loosely is the study of right and wrong. Um, and we have a lot of questions then that come up with that definition. How do we define what's right and what's wrong? How do we recognize when something is right and when something is wrong? And how um, do the consequences of a right action or a wrong action show up? In the philosophy of ethics, there's really no consensus on um, like what is right and what is wrong. But one way to sort of safeguard your actions is by it in a I should say like a production team is to have a diverse team to have a lot of different life experiences represented. Okay. So we'll talk about many stories of where machine learning has sort of gotten in trouble, maybe on accident or on purpose. <laughs> um, and some prompts that are suggested in the book for us are what could we have done in this situation or what could you have done? What kind of obstructions might have prevented you from getting that done? How would you deal with the obstructions and what would you look out for? Okay. So there's three main themes that was presented in the book and the video. And the first one is on recourse and accountability. So essentially an algorithm or software does not have any system of recourse in place, which means we don't necessarily have a mechanism for auditing or holding it responsible or correcting errors that are, you know, feasible and efficient. And it's suggested that we as a community should take responsibility for learning how this software that we're developing might be implemented. Okay, and so there were several examples in the book. The main one was about this healthcare algorithm. So there was this algorithm that was launched to sort of decide how much benefits people would get, how much coverage, and they released it in Arkansas. And immediately there were groups of people that started having huge cuts, but they were not given really any explanation. And it was later found out that it severely affected people with diabetes and cerebral palsy because of a bug in the software. And the whole process of figuring this out was, you know, impeded on people's lives. It was not very fast. Um, and then there's another example about there's this crime database on gang members and on inspection, people were finding that there were like babies, like one year, less than one year old people reported it as being a gang member. Um, and this is included in this section because again- You weren't in a gang when you were one years old? Oh. Yeah, no, it's like an the error, rascals. obvious <laughs> error 
but the method for fixing it is very lengthy, I think is why it's in this section. Um, and the last one is this US, is US credit report system. Uh, there was a statistic in the book that said about 26% of files in the credit report system have errors where, and 5% of them are like detrimental. So it could really impact someone's ability to, you know, buy a house or get a credit uh, loan. Um, and all of these things are like super lengthy. Um, let me see. Yeah. So that's sort of this section of recourse and accountability. That's you interesting. Have... Like, oh, because it's, ahead, the, you're talking about the recourse part, but there's still like the accountability thing, like mm -hmm. who ultimately yeah. should be taken to account, like, you know, taken to the, you know, fired or somehow maybe financially accountable for some of these mistakes that cost people their potentially their lives, but possibly a lot of money. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like I was listening to this podcast this morning related to this, it turns out by just by coincidence, uh, called Not So Standard Deviations. They were talking about mm. she was she was taking uh um what do they call those cars? <laughs> you know, Waymo, uh the oh, AI the Waymo, car. Yeah. And she was like they gave her a ticket for parking in the wrong spot. She was like, Well, <laughs> not my problem. She gets in and goes, but she then she goes, does raise a question like who is accountable for that, or if there's some accident yeah. or whatever. Um, like there's that case of the guy, the Tesla that uh, got to an accident and he was saying, Hey, I was checking my email. A Tesla was driving. It's not my fault. That thing. Well, whose fault is the programmer? Like, who is it? So, and they were saying, yeah. and I think as you were just saying, it repeats what you just said. That's it. People really haven't thought about this enough. Right. There's mm -hmm. it's actually an open problem. Yeah. <laughs> more more yeah. I get involved that, in everything. That was some discussion um, in the chapter about, yeah, who is accountable? In some of these cases, they do end up, you know, blacklisting or going after the actual programmer or the developer who, um, that's why they they emphasize this. Like, if you maybe knew ahead of time, maybe, for example, this healthcare algorithm, if you maybe knew ahead of time the plan that that company had for implementing the algorithm, maybe you would have making, taken more precaution in testing and um, making sure that it's like I don't know fair or ethical um, yeah it's kind of scary though because you make you know mistakes happen right I mean it's like you right. just code the way you think hey <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be really useful <laughs> next thing you know yeah. oh, am I responsible exactly. for this no way uh oh yeah, so maybe yeah. people need I guess people need to that's why this chapter is important is like people need to be thinking about this mm-hmm it's easy enough to like go, ah, it's not going to matter to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to. No, um, no. Yeah. Interesting. Fine. And then the next topic was on feedback loops. And there's two ways, so kind of two feedback loops. One is where you have maybe that your current model is controlling your future data collection design, um, things like reinforcement learning, where you can actually end up um, reinforcing what you're seeing in the first run of the model. And then the other thing is that the predictions of the model, like a recommendation system, can reinforce the actions that people take in the real world, which reinforces then what the the signal that the model found in the first place. So it's an interesting situation that has popped up many times. So I have five different examples here. Um, a lot of them involving YouTube. <laughs> so the first one is that YouTube's recommendation algorithm and a lot of recommendation algorithms, I think, find out that well, people like controversial content. And so they had an algorithm to optimize the length to get people to watch more longer minutes on YouTube. And um, they basically were recommending controversial content. And then this is where the human action comes in. People are watching it, which reinforces 
that the algorithm thinks people like this and it just goes back and forth. So it was leading to this rise in people um, uh, uh, subscribing to, or whatever the word is, being conspiracy theorists. And similarly, but maybe even more <laughs> devastating is um, that led to these curated playlists of young children like in bathing suits or the pajamas like people's home videos but when you string them all together it's like very creepy um and so people were watching these like playlists of just home videos of children wearing little clothing um and then some people actually can game this these algorithms so there's this example that russia today what gaming the YouTube algorithm and it figured out how to get recommended more and it became this big outlier. One positive example is that knowing a little bit about how these feedback loops work, you could think about not including a predictor that or a feature that would um, sort of collapse that the predictions would collapse on, for example, gender. So Meetup, um, you know, the website that has events in your community, and they realize that just because the way society is, is um, already disproportionate not gender ratios and maybe tech meetups, um, and if they use gender as a feature in their recommendation algorithm, it might say, well, more men go to these, so we're gonna only recommend it for men. Um, and so they consciously decided we're not gonna use that as a feature so that hopefully um, gender won't bias what events you're recommended to go to. Although, you know. That's really um, interesting but, because it's a case of where Again, prediction metrics are not always the best scoring thing, right? Because, yeah, you could predict better if you included gender, but you're not getting the results you actually wanted. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, you could yeah. predict who was there better if you included yeah. gender, but you don't necessarily want to continue that in right. pattern in the future. Interesting. Um, and similar to this conspiracy theory one on YouTube, there's the Facebook groups. Um, where if you joined one radical group, it was more likely to just start recommending you to more and more and more radical groups. I wonder if there's like a tie-in. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, which is probably a huge mistake. But <laughs> if if this ties in, like another case where, um, let me say a different way, does this tie into like causal analysis, causal inference thinking? Because in the same way, you wouldn't include something you don't, in other words, don't include a predictor you don't want to be a cause in some sense, right? Mm. <laughs> don't include gender because it's going to be, a, you're going to predict it does well and, you're gonna, and this can become a cause in some sense. Oh. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud, but there's a, there's, that's another case where I know that uh, using prediction metrics doesn't work very well. Like really good predictors are often terrible causal models, right? They do terrible jobs oh. of generalizing and, and uh, predicting. Um, predict are uh, predicting the effects of actual interventions versus just predicting predicting for predicting safe. You know, I don't know if there's a relationship there or not. Feels like there is, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> thinking of that. I think that's a really interesting idea. I don't know a ton about causal inference, um, but yeah, I think that's a, that yeah. could be worth following up on. Yeah, I'll take a look. I'm gonna think about that some more. All right. Um, and then the last theme of this was bias, and it wasn't talking about statistical bias, although I think there is still some overlap, like it's not completely separated, but they're talking about different types of bias, and, the, and these were the four ones. They had a graph that had, from a paper that had let me just pull it up probably. Fast AI. Well, chapter 10. That had like six different biases. Um, 
Oh yeah, there's the Russia thing. In this huge outlier. Oh yeah, here. So yeah, six. So historical representation, measurement, aggregation, evaluation, and deployment. Um, but they only really go through four of them. So we'll go through those four. Historic. We'll go through each of them in the next slide. Historical measurement, aggregation, and representation. One example is this Google search. Um, they talked about this professor. I should. Oh yeah, Latanya Sweeney. So this professor, she Googled herself, which is a natural thing to do. And the ads by Google, you can see can zoom in here are like for um, checking her background check. <laughs> and then when she Googled another researcher's name that was more white sounding, Kirsten Lindquist, the ads were like, you know, find them, like the ones like, find her phone number or at classic ones that were more neutral. And so she started a study then to systematically review with what's the connotation of ads for more um, African-American versus Caucasian names. And she did find some systematic bias in that um, more African-American sounding names received negative advertisers about finding criminal records where the white sounding names were had more neutral ads so that was unfortunate <laughs> i wonder what they were trying to accomplish there like i mean like why would you care about the person's name to try to match them up with ads like oh you sound irish maybe i'm gonna advertise beer or something like that I don't know. it's also yeah, <laughs> I, don't... <laughs> I just don't get it <laughs> Yeah. I don't see how you can not right. offend somebody that with that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just like don't make any assumptions based yeah. on names. Um, so historical bias. This is bias that arises in your algorithm because the system that we live in, so the people, the processes, and society are biased. So then the measurements we get are then biased. So there's tons and tons of examples of racial bias. We um, just saw one, there was this exam. And a lot of them come up in the image classification where we just collect more images from Western and white society. And the bias in society then leads to systematic bias in our data sense, AKA we don't measure people or cultures that we already are sort of biased against. Um, and again, this can be implicit or explicit bias. Which is, um, fixing this is hard because you can't necessarily just get more data, like because the processes are already excluding some people by um, so fixing this problem is hard because the input data has the problem. And that's a hard thing in machine learning. And then there was this example of some data. It goes back to that meetup example where they were predicting, I think it was a tech, they were predicting the job category from a description. And they use gender also, I think, as a predictor and it reinforced bias in the workforce. So the example was in the data set, 14% of surgeons were women, but then in the predictions, it was like an even lower percentage. I kind of wish they would have discussed more if there was like more evidence because they only gave that one example about surgeons. And so I'm naturally like, well, we need more examples, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, uh, makes sense. The prediction said that only 11% of surgeons were women. Um, uh, okay. Some other biases, measurement bias. So there was an example on the stroke prediction. So they were using electronic health records to predict what are the top 
pre-existing um, things that predict a person having a stroke. And when they looked at the top sort of six features, only the first two really had anything, any medical reasoning for being related to stroke. This one was previous stroke and the other was cardiovascular disease. And then everything else didn't have any sort of medical links. It was like benign breast tumor and um, that's the only one that's popping out. And they think that part of the, you know, issue is that the data set is collected on people who use medical care, which we know has biases, especially economic um, biases, because you have to afford to use healthcare. And you, I mean, even like personality, some people just don't want to go to doctors. Um, and then the next one is aggregation bias and I have a little add on here this is where your model you aggregate data in a way that doesn't incorporate all of the appropriate factors interaction terms or non-linearities and I put in parentheses here I think this is related to Vincent's paradox have you heard of that one yeah it could be yeah that makes a good point um where it's like I mean that is an aggregation problem um yeah so. yeah like at the aggregate level um I think the classic example is bias in application gender bias like in education I, I know there's like a classic yeah. example where at the university level there didn't it was like, oh, we have 50 50 students. But then when you went down to each major, there were some um, disparities at yeah. the major level. Yeah, Malcolm Reith uses that example in his uh, statistical rethinking video. Mm. There's somewhere yeah. in the middle there. He talks about that. Yeah. Okay. The I last think that was one here. I'm not sure. Is the representation bias where the model amplifies a simple relationship. So some of these are um, overlapped to some of the examples we've talked about before. Where the model amplifies a simple relationship, for example, with the, the meetup or the surgeon thing, doc, where gender can be um, a reflectance of occupation, like in the current day, but as we're predicting in the future, um, we don't want our models sort of collapse on this one, <laughs> one feature. And as I mentioned, and as they discussed, a lot of these biases are systematic and collecting more data isn't going to fix everything. Um, right, we could like collect more data on patients in hospitals, but again, it's still, patients in hospitals don't represent the broader general population in all aspects. So one of the solutions that they suggest, and they talk about this a lot, is that there should be a more transparent workflow. So better descriptions of data that include what is the context of the data and what types of decisions were made when the data was collected, um, especially I think in public data sets that people sort of just take uh, and use. Okay, so why does this matter to us as developers or programmers, or whatever? Um, so there was this extreme case that they talked about, about IBM and, and Nazi Germany where the CEOs of IBM was working with Hitler on having faster data tabulation. And these products were used to track all of the people they had in their camps that they were murdering. <laughs> they even had a category for how the people were being executed. And at the CEO level, um, like they obviously, I mean, I don't know, the book didn't say, but they must have known what was going on. 
So Watson was meeting with Hitler, but then this is like what we were saying, who is accountable? But all the lower level employees building the product, they didn't necessarily know that they were being sold to Nazi Germany. Um, and so I guess maybe to motivate why it matters and why you should ask more questions or be comfortable asking more questions to your maybe bosses um, is because like, how would you feel if you found out that your product you were developing just in your normal everyday vanilla life was being used in a genocide? Um, and would you even want to know? I, don't, I think that was a good question. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I guess I would want to know, so I would yeah. do something about it. I don't know. Right? <laughs> Who knows? Um, so I think in our current society, one of the ways we can help uh, is yeah, asking questions to our higher ups. And um, I don't work in industry, so this is like a little bit of a different mindset, but uh, I know Jeremy was discussing about, and I think it's totally natural to feel like, you know, I have this job and I want to keep it. I don't want to ruffle feathers. Um, but he was kind of saying like, you should feel a little more empowered um, and you should say, be comfortable with saying no, if you're not satisfied with the answers about, you know, how is this product going to be implemented or used? Um, yeah. And then the last point here is sort of a, I guess a, a little bit of a debate to the statement, well, humans are biased, so why do we care if machine learning is biased? So there's a discussion on, well, algorithms and humans are not interchangeable. Um, algorithms are often implemented to save money and they affect um, people disproportionately. Uh, if you think about the Arkansas healthcare thing that was used, um, I don't know what company used it, but it was used to save money, right? So that we didn't that people, their company didn't have more of an automatic way to decide on benefits. Um, and that's going to affect certain parts of society more than others when uh, we think about who receives the consequences of um, cost-effective decisions that a company makes. That was one thing I remembered on that discussion. Yeah. And again, if you just think about the accountability, right? It, there are more systems in place to keep a human accountable than an algorithm yeah, the, in our society yeah. right now. <laughs> exactly. All right. Oh, this one did it. I forgot a white line. But uh, here's a few steps in addition to maybe um, asking the right question. It, to analyze a project you are working on, um, implement processes at your company to find and address ethical risks, try to support good policy and uh, increase diversity. Yeah. Okay, and that's pretty oh, much all I had. Good. Yeah, that was basically the main points they discussed. I think they just, they told like a lot of stories. There was one interesting, Oh, yeah, there's Watson and, and Hitler. Wow. Um, Crazy. Interesting image that I found. Oh, yeah, there was the. Yeah, the, so there's. Um, I don't know what model it is, but they had these images of this household items and just showing how it's biased towards Western culture. This is Nepal. It has the soap, which I mean, this is a bar of soap. It's pretty common, but this, oh, there's six models. Um, food. Yeah, they all like put it as food. What is that fuzzy thing, though? Is that like a. Um, I don't know rubber? if that's like steel wool or something. <laughs> yeah. 
And then these are some spices and oils from the Philippines. And I mean, yeah, brown sugar spices. This one is not as egregious as this yeah. one, but yeah. Um, yeah, so that's mm. a lot. Oh, these are the accidental injury, breast lump, colonoscopy, and sinusitis. So just things that indicate someone gets regular checkups. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's all I really have. Um, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm glad you're. Hey, I'll have to get but make some time to go over that chapter in a little more detail. Some, but I'm glad you're able yeah. to go through it. And give me the give us all the highlights. Yeah, um, yeah. Of it anyway. Yeah. And the main it's, the main ideas. It was getting a little bit depressing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, these are hard problems. I mean, it's fine yeah. to sit there and run regression models and talk about right. You know, building. Yeah. You know, uh, building neural networks and everything else, but then when you think, hey, there's some real hard problems here about the data quality, data bias, yeah. um, accountability. That's such a big one to me. I've been thinking about that. Yeah. All day. They mentioned in that podcast, I would think about that all day. There's accountability problem. Like, what can you do? Like, there's no obvious answer. Like, the programmer is that fair? I mean, uh, and there's a whole team usually. Who are you going to blame? Is it the right the charge? But like, you know, that doesn't seem fair. They weren't driving the car. It's like blaming your mom for. You know why you yeah. hit somebody, right? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. It's not my fault. <laughs> my mom and dad made me. <laughs> I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? Blame God? I don't know. So it's like yeah. it's a tough problem, right? Can't give a ticket to a computer. In fact, that happened right. here in, in Arizona. We have the Waymo here in Arizona, and the Waymo like went down a wrong way road, and the cop pulled it over. But it really, in the end, it just like talked. There's like the Waymo have a system where you can talk to the way the Google people. Oh. The, um, on a camera and they talk back to you and they please talk to him explain what happened they explain what happened and then you end up just writing not writing a ticket just wrote couldn't it, he wrote something like couldn't issue a ticket to a computer that was like his, his report oh <laughs> it was something like that and i'm like well that's not right i mean somebody needs to be out of the, the thing broke the rules or the road and i would yeah. get a ticket but it didn't get a ticket right right so, um very strange i guess i didn't include it in the notes there was a ray of sunshine at the end that Jeremy um, was discussing that he thinks of the AI age oh. as a now it's going to be as analogous to um, the car industry where in the beginning cars were super unsafe um, and then people started to fight for their for more safety features um, and now we have seat belts and airbags and uh, I mean, it's much more complicated than just That's putting true. a seatbelt in. <laughs> but yeah, that is true. I posted the article. I found it uh, on oh, Arizona cool. Central about that incident that happened in July. So it wasn't that long ago. But I mean, it's, that website is horrible. It's just loaded with ads and everything. But it does have the information <laughs> in there. <somewhere>. It's like, <laughs> wow. That's true. Yeah, there's a weight ray of hope. Yeah, we're just kind of in the early stages, and everybody's kind of fumbling around and. Yeah, I'm sadly, I probably some people. I, well, evidently, people have been hurt by this, and I think more people will be hurt by this. And we just have to do our best to try to yeah prevent these disruptions from being being more than just disruptions, right? Right. So, yeah. yeah, very interesting topic. Yeah. Well, thanks for discussing with me. And next week, Andrew is I think still in the yeah docket for 